So, U.S. budget, it's $4 trillion. What percentage of that budget is spent on non-military foreign aid to other countries? What do you think? What do you think? $4 trillion, what percent of the $4 trillion do we spend on non-military foreign aid? And when we're talking about non-military foreign aid, we're talking about this stuff. Natural disasters, population control, transportation, electricity, water, sanitation, refugees, housing, AIDS, HIV, food. What do you think? Go talk to the person next to you. What do you think it is? Most Americans will, when we, when we say foreign aid to Americans, most people of, often think, you know, how much money do we give in foreign aid? Many Americans will include military aid in that. Um, but when we ask most Americans, they will say about 25%. That's the average answer, 25%, right? And so, so the United States, this is in millions of dollars, right? So we are the most generous of all because we have the largest budget and we give the most money by far. You know, look, I mean, you know, you have Germany, UK, look where we're at here, right? Um, in terms of the percent of money that we give, it is about one half of one percent. And, you know, Americans, we have this sense that, you know, we're giving and giving and giving, uh, but there are many other countries out there that give a lot more percentage-wise, right? Because in many ways, it's, it's, it's both about how much you give and it's also about the percent. I talk about this. Because when we start thinking about helping other countries or helping our own country, it's really important that we have an understanding of what we're talking about and what we mean by that. I want to say something about Haiti. Look, this is Haiti, right? So here's the coast of Florida. So this is what we're talking about. It's not very far away, 60 years. And 80% of the country lives in poverty. I mean, really, in, in poverty, pretty deep poverty. 54% live in abject poverty. And abject poverty is poverty where people have no chance at all of in any way moving forward. They will not move forward. They are barely surviving, right? Like, you, we are talking people who are sleeping on the side of the road, people who have, uh, you know, kind of some mud walls and straw, or maybe, maybe if they're lucky, corrugated aluminum for a roof, but sleeping on a dirt floor, maybe a mat. You know, I was in someone's home, and what they had in the home was um, a mat made of straw, and that was the bed, and it was probably about the size of this door right here, and six people slept on that mat, and it was hot. It was already, it was hot. It, this was at night. It was outside. It was 90 degrees. And I know inside that, that building of sorts, it was well, well, well over 100. So we're talking about abject poverty, right? We mostly don't, those aren't the people with whom we work because we're trying to work with people who will, will, are, are poor, but will also have a chance of, of moving forward in a way that they can then turn around and help somebody else. So... Um, Haiti has just, just this is not a chance of, of moving, right? And now, you know, with Americans having just an increasing calls for spending less and less and less, then this just becomes really incredibly difficult. Haiti was one of the most profitable colony, slave colonies of the Europeans. In the case of Haiti, it was France. One of the most profitable there's a lot of debate about how much profit they raised, but actually, I would say the single most profitable for France in the 1700s. The average life of a slave was about five to six years. It was cheaper to go to Africa and get more slaves and bring them to Haiti and work them to death than it was to allow the slaves to live some, a life that would be in some way humane. So work people to death and make profit, made so much profit. And when you think about Europe and you think about the United States and you think about the, the immense wealth that was built on the backs of slaves, of a slave system, it's really, it's mind-boggling. So Haiti, one of the most profitable colonies. 
The Haitians did what the founding fathers did in the United States. The slaves in Haiti rose up and they threw out the French. It was bloody, it was violent, but they did exactly what we would want them to do. Am I right? If you knew that there was a slave colony off the coast of the United States, how many of you would support the slave masters? Nobody. You'd support the slaves. They did exactly what the founding fathers in the United States did. The problem was when they overthrew, they threw out the French. It was a big risk to the United States and to all the other slave-owning countries because if you have the Haitian slaves who successfully lead a revolution against their slave masters for whom they are working and making enormous profits, what's, that, what's going to happen in the United States? Because slavery is like what Thomas Jefferson said. It's like holding a wolf by the ears and its teeth are snapping at you and you're holding it by the ears and you can't let it go and you can't hold on. You know you're not going to hold on, but you can't let it go. And so the Americans and the British and the French and the Spanish, they all came together and they said, look, okay, you, you hate slaves now. Here you are in Haiti. But the slaves had nothing. Because they didn't have the technology, they didn't have the resources, they didn't have the things they needed, what they needed. And, and most importantly, they didn't have trading partners because all of the slave-owning countries, including the United States, decided, listen, we're just going to immiserate them. These slaves who won their freedom, won their freedom against their violent, violent slave masters, we're going to immiserate them. And we're going to embargo the whole country and nobody will trade with them. So even when the Haitians are continuing to grow the sugar, they were responsible for half the sugar. Two-thirds of the coffee that was produced. And so even now they're producing it on their own. Nobody will trade with them. So you got all this coffee, you got all this sugar, but nothing can happen. And so Haiti becomes immiserated, just immensely immiserated and poor. So instead of growing the first black republic in the history of the world, instead of growing and expanding, Haiti just gets poorer and poorer. You know, even today, like rice, you know, rice. This $430 million, that's how much we subsidize our rice farmers in the United States. Haiti had, Haiti had, there's Haitian rice. It's really good rice and a thriving rice production. And $430 million, right? That's how much money, $350 million we gave Haiti in financial aid last year to help deal with poverty. That's how much we gave them. 430 million, that's how much we gave our rice. We subsidized our rice farmers who then turn around and we force our rice onto Haiti. We force them to buy our rice. Took them to the world court to say like, no, nah, man, we're going to force that on you. So like, ah, it's just like, whew, I wish, I just wish I could download some of this stuff, but it's just, it's just a fairness thing. Y'all right? So anyway, that's, that's why we work in Haiti. 